Well, good, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here, those um, that are uh, in person and all of those of you online. It's really a pleasure and an honor here to introduce uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Professor uh, Jim Genuzzi. I've actually known him for several years through our interest in biomarkers, troponin, myocardial infarction. And as many of you know, our system is making the big change just in last January for, from changing from uh, standard troponin and BNP to high sensitivity to proponing and anti-pro BNP. So when we were thinking about this, I thought, well, you know, who, you know, we were really poised and who else best to have as uh, Professor Jim Genuzzi, who's really the expert in the field in this issue. He's the Hutter Family Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He's the Director of Guideline Directed Medical Therapy Clinic in Cardiology Division at Mass General Hospital. And he's also the Director of Heart Failure and Biomarker Trials at the Bain Institute for Clinical Research. He's a recognized a clinician, a teacher, a trialist, uh, and his work has really focused on the interface of biomarker testing and therapeutics for a broad range of diseases, uh, in particular heart failure and acute coronary syndromes and diabetes. He's part of the universal definition of MI. He's done extensive work with natriuretic peptides, over 750 publications, more than 100,000 citations, and he's a trustee of the American College of Cardiology and an associate editor at Jack. So it's really, I think, an honor and a, and, a, and a wonderful opportunity for us to have him here to teach us about how to best integrate the use of anti-pro VMP into our practice. So thank you so much, uh, Jim, for joining us. Yeah, Yadar, thank you for, for asking me to, to join you virtually. I'm sorry that I, I uh, couldn't be there uh, physically, but, you know, I, I really love Minneapolis, love love your health system. It's been um, great working with, with you all over the years uh, intermittently for different reasons. And this is a good opportunity to get reconnected and, and talk about this change that you're making. Um, and, you know, for the audience, you've got a world's expert on troponin, uh, that being Dr. Sandoval, who will help guide you with the shift from troponin I to troponin T. Um, arguably, the change from natriuretic peptides is uh, from one from BNP to NT-pro BNP is, is less subtle. Um, there are, there are larger differences, um, not bad, but differences. Uh, so going from uh, troponin I to troponin T, there'll be some reference range um, uh, changes and, and other aspects and some low end sensitivity differences. But um, with uh, with the natriuretic peptides, it will it will take a little work. But um, you know, not in a bad way, like I said, because there are some real advantages with NT Pro BNP uh, that I think uh, you'll hopefully recognize over time. So my disclosures are here. Uh, I am a, a I'm the director of uh, heart failure and biomarker trials at the BAME Institute, and we do a lot of industry-sponsored research, so it's important to recognize that. But probably a larger disclosure is the fact that, you know, I'm a clinician, and, and um, despite the fact that I've been working with biomarkers now for, uh, gosh, uh, um, 25 years, maybe longer, um, you know, I fully recognize that there's no substitute for clinical judgment. I mean, it's just really important to 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 get that right out, out front, because I think that when you start considering the role of biomarkers to support clinical judgment and recognizing that a good clinician doesn't approach things with a monosynaptic reflex arc, right? You know, the, a good clinician remembers the differential diagnosis um, uh, for a medical condition. It, same thing goes for a test result. Um, but it, th that means, therefore, that even when a natriuretic peptide test returns a result that may not necessarily um, uh, be on target for the diagnosis of heart failure, in quotes, in air quotes, um, it, they may be telling you something really important um, about the, the patient that might not be as obvious at the bedside. So I, I, I you know, it, it cuts in both directions. You know, we need to keep our, our thinking caps on, but it's also necessary to recognize that, you know, the, it's very unusual to get an analytical false positive with, with, trip, uh, with troponin or natriuretic peptide tests. So when they're abnormal, it's up to us to try to figure out why. So with that preamble, uh, you know, out of the way, we'll talk about natriuretic peptide biology. I promise I'll keep it, you know, simple. Um, we'll talk about the established applications and then the emerging uses that I think really are going to blow wide open in the next couple of years. Um, you know, no talk on the natriuretic peptides would be complete with 
without recognizing a giant in the field, that being, um, uh, well, two giants, really, uh, Eugene Braunwald, who speculated back in 1964 that um, the, the heart is an endocrine organ. He was editorializing, um, uh, and only in the way that Dr. Braunwald can, he was editorializing on a paper that he was an author on. Um, they uh, they were uh, discussing the measurement of C-reactive protein in people with heart failure, which is not really germane to the heart as an endocrine organ because it wasn't being released by the heart. But he speculated that someday someone would identify substances that the heart was releasing that uh, might be measured in a manner um, to be clinically useful to inform heart disease presence and severity. And then we jump to the gentleman in the middle photograph, that's Adolfo DeBold, who uh, sadly passed away not long ago. Um, uh, Professor DeBold was at, uh, at the Ottawa Heart Institute, not far from you, all north of you. Um, and uh, DeBold described in 1980, in about 1984 or so, um, the electron dense granules that you see in the right panel. These, panel, these granules were isolated from atrial uh, tissue homogenates from rats. And through ultracentrifugation um, techniques, um, DeBold isolated um, these uh, the substances in the granules and re-injected them, and they induced an intense naturesis and diuresis, which was subsequently um, recognized as being due to what he referred to initially as atrial naturetic factor, and you know, subsequently identified as atrial natriuretic peptide uh, because, in fact, it was then identified as being a protein. And the natriuretic peptide family are all particulate guanylocyclase activators. They bind to natriuretic peptide receptors, which is an important point I'll go to in a moment, um, the biologically active forms, at least. And these are the biologically active forms. There's ANP, uridylatin, which is otherwise known as ularitide. It was a drug. Um, uh, then there's B-type natriuretic peptide. BNP was also found in brain tissue. And so for a while, it was called brain natriuretic peptide, of course, um, uh, we all recognize now that the overwhelming majority of BNP is made in the heart, and, and therefore the name brain natriuretic peptide has been dropped in favor of just calling it B-type. There's a C-type natriuretic peptide. I don't know why this is out of order, but a C-type natriuretic peptide uh, isolated from endothelium. And then outside of the, the human um, uh, 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 species, there's a, a, a D-type natriuretic peptide isolated from uh, isolated from venom uh, from the green mamba. And the reason why they're grouped this way, I was joking, is because the, the first four bind to the A receptor and CNP binds to the B receptor for natriuretic peptides. Um, th th it's remarkable how conserved the natriuretic peptides are across species. The, the, the B-type natriuretic peptide in humans is very similar to that in fish, actually. And it's thought that natriuretic peptides um, evolved um, from uh, deep water fish as a, a way to regulate blood osmolarity. That would, at least that's the theory. Um, and uh, the, the, the ring structure in particular is critical for, and there's a reason why I'm bringing this up, is critical for bi the biological activity of the bioactive natriuretic peptides. So how did we get to where we are now in 2023 in Minneapolis, Minnesota, talking about N-terminal pro-BNP? Well, let's talk about how the natriuretic peptides arise and that'll hopefully explain why there are slight differences, modest differences at times between the two peptides. In the setting of whatever trigger um, exists to cause release of, of the B-type natriuretic peptides, in this case, um, uh, let's just say wall stress. I, I, I don't like just going right to the heart failure paradigm because it turns out anything that stresses a, my, a myocyte will cause upregulation of the, the uh, NPPB gene, which results in a translation of a protein that's a pre-propeptide that's 134 amino acids long intracellularly. This peptide gets clipped and the signal peptide is released, yielding an intracellular propeptide called ProBNP1 to 108. So this 108 amino acid peptide is a precursor that subsequently gets processed and cleaved into N-terminal pro-BNP, a linear 76 amino acid peptide that, as far as we know, is biologically inert 
In addition, it liberates the 32 amino acid BNP with that ring structure that I mentioned earlier, requisite for its biological activity. And that's the business end of the molecule. BNP32 binds to, as I've already showed you, the NPRA receptor. So it binds to the A receptor, um, triggering intracellular cascade, resulting in vasodilatation, reductions in fibrosis, hypertrophy, naturesis, diuresis, improved leucotropy. And really, if you want to think about it, teleologically, what the heart's trying to do is it's trying to counterbalance the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. It's not a perfect sort of, you know, balancing act. But nonetheless, there, you know, there's clear evidence that things that activate the, the RAS will activate the BNP cascade as well. Now, <clears throat> I've got up in this upper left-hand corner the fact that neprilysin, found in the brush border of the kidneys largely, but also circulating in blood, um, is responsible for clearance of, uh, of BNP, ANP, and CNP, actually uh, ANP more than uh, the others. Um, and that's true because when you look actually at this snapshot, this picture of, you know, a perfect world where you have the intracellular pro-BNP 108 being clipped into these two peptides, back when I came and spoke at Abbott in 2005 about natriuretic peptides, I probably showed a slide very similar to this. And that was what we understood as the truth of the situation, which is to say that there was one and the other, and they were, you know, completely different, and there was no relationship. And it turns out, actually, that this is quite incorrect in, in multiple ways. The first is that owing to the fact that the body wants to get rid of BNP quickly, BNP has a half-life of around 20 minutes or so. It's biologically active, so it binds to receptors and stimulates biological activity, activities, diuresis, naturesis. The body wants to get rid of it, so neprilysin acts quite rapidly. There are other enzymes, DPP4, meprin A. There are other um, metalloproteinases that will degrade BNP. It turns out, actually, that when you're measuring BNP, you're getting a signal that's related to a number of different fragments being measured. It's not just BNP. Um, and that's, I think, relevant because um, uh, the, it turns out that each of these different fragments has have different biological activities. And so um, it, it, it's also of note that while um, we previously thought that NT pro BNP was sort of hanging out alone, not being degraded, you know, perfectly pristine and easily measured, it turns out, number one, the N-terminal portion of nt pro -BMP has variable amounts of, of glycosylation, sugar deposition, which may cause um, variable capture in the immunoassays that we use for its measurement, which is why it's reassuring that the assays that we all use for nt pro -BMP are largely based on the same antibodies. But in addition, remember this precursor peptide, pro -BMP 108 it turns out that a lot of it is released, particularly in advancing heart failure. And what's really pretty amazing about this is, if you think about it, immunoassays that uh, that will uh, detect NT pro BNP or BNP will actually detect this peptide. So, regardless of which peptide you're measuring, uh, especially in advancing heart failure, much of what you're detecting is this large inactive precursor peptide. So, it's a preamble to say that we've learned a lot about the things that we're measuring in the setting of and natriuretic peptide uh, testing, but there's still a lot that we need to learn. The good news is that the results of these tests remain very robust and provide us important clinical information. Now, what about clearance? I've talked about release and I've me mentioned neprilysin already. One of the most common misconceptions about um, clearance of BNP and NT pro BNP is this absolutely incorrect um, uh, concept that uh, NT pro BNP is more dependent on kidney function for its clearance. It's just simply not true. Um, we did a, a mechanistic study 
measuring um, concentrations of NT pro BNP and BNP going into the kidneys and coming out of the kidneys um, and looked at corrected for renal blood flow and found that around 20 to 22 percent um, of clearance of BNP and NT pro BNP are related um, to, uh, to, to uh, renal clearance. And so um, down to a GFR of like 15. Now, to be sure, NT pro BNP has a longer half-life. So if clearance is slower in the setting of a longer half-life, there's no question that you'll see higher concentrations among individuals with chronic kidney disease. But that doesn't mean that proportionally the, the increase is any different from BNP. It's just the number is much larger. And that's one of the things that people have some discomfort about when going from BNP to NT pro BNP, very similar to when you transitioned from conventional uh, troponin to high sensitivity troponin, where everything was a thousand times larger. The good news is with N with NT pro BNP, everything is not a thousand times larger. It's more like eight eight fold, six to eight fold larger. So, for a BNP of a hundred, you'll get an NT pro BNP of like eight to nine hundred, um, generally speaking. Um, so uh, again, kidney function is important, but they're equal between the two. The other, uh, and I mentioned nature, uh, naturotic peptide receptors clearing BNP. Neprilysin has taken on a particularly important role these days because any heart failure specialist will tell you we use neprilysin inhibition to treat heart failure patients with secubitril valsartan. Um, the BNP um, uh, peptide seen in the middle has multiple places where neprilysin assaults the BNP particle to chop it up. So it, it's um, of note and importance to remember that different BNP assays bind to different places in the BNP um, uh, protein, which means that depending on which assay you use, there may be differences in the amount of BNP change that you see. But what's interesting is that Although the Paradigm trial, which was published now 10 years ago, suggested that BNP rose up to 20% after initiation of secubitril valsartan, um, more recent data have actually argued that the change is much less substantial. And that also goes along with clinical experience. Um, in the PROVHF study, we me measured a, a bunch of different naturetic peptides. Um, and what we found actually was that um, Unlike the 30 to 32% reduction in NT pro BNP, because NT pro BNP is not um, a target for neprilysin, um, BNP didn't fall. It didn't rise very much, but it didn't fall. And, and so, um, yeah, you know, this really, uh, you know, shows that, you know, neprilysin inhibition does play a role um, uh, in causing a sp spurious uh, lack of change in BNP and even maybe a slight rise. But notably, um, whoops, notably, when you look at which assays are used, um, you can see subtle differences that may be significant. These data were published in clinical chemistry showing that depending on which BNP assay you, you use, there may be differences. Some may rise while others may fall. So this is another good reason why many of us have switched to um, N-terminal pro BNP because with the growing rise of neprilysin inhibition as a treatment strategy for heart failure and the growing use of monitoring of natriuretic peptides, particularly in the outpatient setting, but also in the inpatient setting for therapy monitoring, um, having a, um, a, a more accurate read of the, the, the state of, the, of myocardial stress as reflected in natriuretic peptides is important. So clinically, when we're thinking about interpreting natriuretic peptide concentrations, I want to ask you to think about the venue. So let's think as clinicians now, the venue with which you're going to measure these peptides, because how you think about the results will differ somewhat depending on where you're measuring them. And of course, the usual circumstances, measurement in the acute setting, right? In the emergency department, acute dyspnea, patient coming in with uh, volume overload, and and if you remember that cardiomyocyte stress, transmural wall stress, is the driver for natriuretic peptide release, then contextually in a patient with acute heart failure, what drives acute heart failure is volume overload, generally speaking. And so when we, when we think about acute heart failure, the majority of the signal is driven by volume. 
On the other hand, in chronic heart failure or in well diuresed acute heart failure, you begin to shift from the compartment that is all about volume overload to now the background signal, which is related to other aspects of cardiac structure and function. And so again, volume overload, critically important in acute heart failure, but underneath it all is the sort of the, the foundational signal that may be detected as a consequence of systolic and diastolic abnormalities, the size of the left ventricle. It always comes back to the law of Laplace, right? So the larger the chamber size, the more the wall stress. And that's important to remember because when you're measuring these peptides in preserved EF heart failure, because the chamber size in hef pef is typically smaller, you have lower wall stress and hence typically lower natriuretic peptide values. So it's important to remember the left ventricular correlates, but remember folks that there's myocardium in the right ventricle, not as much, hence the amount of release is lower. nt proBNP is probably a bit more sensitive than, than BNP for right ventricular involvement. Um, you, you will see signals that you might not have seen before when you were measuring BNP, but we'll talk about that actually when we start talking about numbers, you know, trying to understand what the numbers mean. Um, left and right atrial size and volume, valvular heart disease, there's a clinical trial ongoing right now looking at uh, natriuretic peptides to guide decision making about TAVR, for example. Um, uh, filling pressures are important. Very importantly, heart rhythm. Patients in atrial fibrillation typically have higher natriuretic peptide values than those in sinus rhythm. I know you know this. Importantly, up to 25% of people in AFib, however, may have values above the threshold for acute heart failure. And it's important to recognize that may just simply be from wall stress in the atrium or ventricle for that matter, if the rate control is, uh, is not, uh, uh, not adequate. Clinically, as I said, no clinician goes into, um, uh, into a clinical evaluation with a single diagnosis in their differential, right? So when you see individuals with abnormal um, uh, natriuretic peptides, you know, probably the biggest mistake we made back in the early 2000s was to go out and say, yeah, this is a biomarker or a heart failure. Probably not a smart move. Great marketing, but not a smart move clinically because, you know, the good clinician recognizes that, there are a lot of things that can cause transmural wall stress besides heart failure. Yes, there's no question. The higher the concentration of natriuretic peptide, the greater the positive predictive value for linking it to a diagnosis of heart failure. And it may be actually that a person with pneumonia with an NT pro BNP of 20,000 has both, right? And I think that's also necessary to sort of acknowledge is that patients don't come with a single diagnosis frequently. And so, um, you know, I, you know, I, I can give plenty of examples of people who came in with a pulmonary embolism who also had heart failure. Um, of course, uh, 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 significant infectious diseases, including um, SARS-CoV-2 infection, may cause elevations uh, in natriuretic peptide from myocarditis, type 2 myocardial infarction, stress cardiomyopathy, all sorts of different triggers. So one needs to contextualize the result. You, you, you can't go into it as you know, as we did, you know, 20 years ago when we first started measuring this, assuming that it's only about heart failure. Now, the uh, current heart failure clinical practice guidelines have natriuretic peptides well embedded, and I'm going to give you sort of the approach with NT pro BNP. The first, of course, being diagnosis. Um, this is an oldie but a goodie. One of the first studies that I did back way, way back in the early 2000s, the PRIDE study looked at individuals with acute dyspnea um, relative to their natriuretic peptide concentrations, showing that, um, not surprisingly, nt pro -BNP and those with acute decompensated heart failure, the median was over 4,000. Those with prior heart failure, remember this population in the middle, we're going to talk about them later, um, with prior structural heart disease, once your heart muscle is abnormal, it's pretty unusual, even if you are not in acute heart failure to have a normalized natriuretic peptide value, but that number is quite 
um, prognostically important. And of course, the negative predictive value was excellent for excluding heart failure. And so the earliest results for nt pro BNP in the PRIDE study, clinical judgment was very good for the diagnosis of heart failure. And t pro BNP alone was actually better, but the two together was the optimal approach. Now, what we found in PRIDE was that although nt pro BNP was uh, superior to clinical judgment and the two together uh, uh, were the best combination, um, choosing a single cutoff was problematic for one reason. It was actually quite sensitive, the optimal cutoff, if you were only going to use one threshold value. You know, like if you think back to your BNP of 100, um, it, it was an NT pro BNP of 900. And it gave, you know, good sensitivity and good specificity. But um, the, the specificity wasn't as good as the sensitivity and the positive predictive value at best was like 75, 76%. So stated another way, if you use likelihood ratios, which is probably a statistically more sound approach, you, you know, if you are below 100 for, for BNP or uh, below 900, you know, you had pretty good ability to rule out heart failure. But if you are above those threshold values, you know, your likelihood ratio positive wasn't 10 or greater, right? Which means that your positive predictive value, you know, isn't quite as good. And what that means, let me translate it to clinical speak. There are a lot of things that cause natriuretic peptides to be high besides heart failure right? So we began to ask, well, what explains the lower positive predictive value? And we actually turned to the BNP literature to try to understand this, because at the time, we, it wasn't really well understood with NT pro BNP. So we, we started with the BNP literature. And what we found was that for every decade increase in age, there was a 30% higher likelihood for a BNP over 100. So this is why with BNP, you use the 100 to 500 gray zone. More or less, it's driven by age and the comorbidities that come along with it. So we decided to try to address this with an age-adjusted approach for cutting natriuretic peptide concentrations. And so we did the first of two different studies called ICON. So the original ICON study um, looked at both the ability to exclude heart failure and the ability to diagnose heart failure. And what we found was that if you're healthy, it didn't matter what your age was. And an NT pro BNP below 300, regardless of age, provided a very high sensitivity, a negative predictive value of 99%, the negative likelihood ratio right around that 0.1 threshold. So, so point number one at the Massachusetts General Hospital in our lab information system, it lists the cutoffs and it says an NT pro BNP below 300, regardless of age, provides very high negative predictive value for excluding heart failure. So, so that's important to, to remember. On the other hand, while 900 alone was pretty good for identifying heart failure, to improve the likelihood ratio and improve positive predictive value, we found that an age stratified cutoff approach, and believe me, we looked at age, kidney function, age and kidney function, sex, BMI, all sorts of different combinations. It really just came down to age. An age stratification of less than 50, 50 to 75, and greater than 75 with optimal cutoffs that are just double each level, 450, 900, and 1800, improved um, positive predictive value significantly. It was better than the single cutoff strategy. Now, fast forward, gosh, 15 years later, because of any number of reasons, not the least of which the FDA has required all of the natriuretic peptide vendors to reevaluate their uh, assays and cutoffs, we did the ICON Reloaded study. And ICON Reloaded went into the the um, went into this with the same approach, which is we wanted to validate the cutoffs from ICON that we uh, we had identified 15 years earlier both for ruling in and ruling out heart failure. And the punchline is much like in Pride, much like in ICON, the updated uh, uh, NT pro BMP assay, this is from Roche Diagnostics, had a higher uh, concentration in those with adjudicated heart failure with an excellent balance of sensitivity and specificity, an area under the ROC curve of 0.91. And much like in prior studies of um, uh, uh, of heart failure and natriuretic peptides, 
the triple cutoff strategy had a, a really even better um, uh, uh, ability to identify heart failure and held on to its negative likelihood ratio as well. So um, uh, really when you contextualize the results, very similar area under the ROC curve to other trials, um, comparable if not superior positive likelihood ratio and excellent ability to rule out heart failure. So that's the good news. But there's no simple way to go into this. And again, I absolutely refuse to take the approach that some back in the 2000s initially went in with that, who would say, yeah, you know, all you need is, a, you know, one, this biomarker, it's all good. Wrong. You need to remember the differential diagnosis for the test. We don't measure, uh, you know, transaminases without thinking about what causes them to be abnormal. You can't measure an atriotic peptide without thinking about what causes them to be abnormal. So the clinical diagnosis is important. Remembering the, um, the heart uh, uh, morphologic aspects of what makes the, the test abnormal is important, but also remembering and rem troubleshooting what causes these tests to be abnormal when the person may not have heart failure. So again, you've seen this list previously, you know, I mean, this is, yeah, you could take natriuretic peptides out and put troponins in. What are the things that make these tests abnormal in the absence of a clinical diagnosis of heart failure? And it's whatever causes wall stress, right? And so remembering that is critically important. Now, of course, very high values are much more likely to be associated with heart muscle abnormalities brushing up against that clinical diagnosis of heart failure. It is a continuous variable. Um, on the other hand, unexpectedly low concentrations sometimes throw clinicians. And this is an important point to stop and ask oneself. I want you all to think about, and you've got experience with BNP, and the same thing goes with BNP. What is a normal natriuretic peptide value, right? I just said on the last slide, these are continuous variables, right? So starting from zero all the way up to with NT pro BNP, 35,000 is the upper bound for the assay. Most labs do one dilution. So from zero to 70,000, right? Where does normal sit? And, and that's important because when a person with obesity hits the hospital with typically with HFPEF, right? and they've got acute heart failure, it's not at all unusual to see their NT pro BNP or BNP to be below the upper reference limit, right? So it's not turned red in your lab information system. But here's the key. A middle-aged person, they'll get an NT pro BNP threshold of 900, right? 899 is not normal no matter whether a person is middle-aged or elderly, a normal natriuretic peptide, if I measured an NT pro BNP in Dr. Sandoval, for example, it'd probably be less than assay. Um, mine is 22. So when you look at nature, NT pro BNP values and they come in at like 200, 300, 400, that's not normal. And so then it's about contextualizing the result to the patient sitting in front of you and looking for values, uh, looking for aspects in their clinical history, obesity, um, which suppresses the BNP gene and causes lower release in the setting of heart failure less wall stress from heart failure with preserved EF, more mild heart failure. So now you're shifting towards that, that other compartment that causes release of cardiac structure and functional abnormalities, right heart failure, less myocardium, treatment of heart failure. People treated with neprilysin inhibitors tend to have lower NT pro BNP values. All of these factors are important to think about so you don't you know, take the bait and say it's not heart failure if the NT pro BNP is like 500, right? Because often, and particularly if you integrate clinical variables that help you to understand the presentation, um, that may assist with the interpretation of these intermediate natriuretic peptide concentrations. And importantly, folks, remember that um, if you remember that a, a normal NT pro BNP for someone, say, under age 50 is, you know, 50, 40, 30. Um, and for somebody at middle age, no higher than about 70 or 80, when you start seeing these middle ground NT pro BNPs, they are prognostic. 
And so it's important to integrate that into your thinking. So, okay, it's not above the threshold value for um, identifying the diagnosis of heart failure, but if it's in that abnormal, but not you know, above the upper reference limit zone, it's important to remember that prognosis is not entirely perfect, right? So I, I, I try to encourage people to think about both BNP and NT pro BNP and as a continuous variable, because where you sit in that continuum is really critically important to inform, um, it, you know, subsequent treatment decisions. But on the plus side, we looked at in Icon Reloaded a much more contemporary clinical um, population. We looked at the associations between natriuretic peptide testing and outcomes. And what we found was, you know, fewer initial hospitalizations when utilized with this logic that I just sort of went through, um, fewer need for lower need for ICU use, um, reduction in utilization, including in particular for echocardiography. There are great data to show that if your nt pro -BNP is below 300, the likelihood for meaningful structural abnormalities on ECHO is pretty darn low. And at Mass General Hospital, if you order an ECHO, you immediately tag on about 1.4 days in hospital stay just for waiting for the, the study to occur. And then of course, the early rule out and discharge, just like with high sensitivity troponin is money in the bank for getting people home appropriately. The good news is when we look at cost savings, sure, it's cost savings, but importantly, if you're in the lower right-hand quadrant here, it's cost effective, right? With reduction in serious adverse events and money saving, right? So that's important. Um, what about for diagnosis of heart failure in the office? Now this is evolving. And so I'm not gonna give you the same deluge of slides that I just did, other than to say, now you're dealing with someone whose symptoms may be related to congestion, but remember that structural heart disease now in a lesser congested non-acute patient plays a much more important role, which means that the concentrations typically are much lower. Therefore, we really focus on the negative predictive value-based approach to exclude the diagnosis. And so in somebody with dyspnea, it starts with history and physical, you measure natriuretic peptide concentrations. And even though your lab information system may give you the acute heart failure cutoffs, remember this value of 125. And we're gonna come back to it again because 125 is where in the population you start to see a rise in risk, right? And so that's where we, we use it in the office at that level in order to exclude heart failure. If you're below that value, heart failure is unlikely. Whereas if you're at or above that value, that's when you trigger workup for heart failure. The next step would be probably echocardiography for evaluation of dyspnea. And there are dyspnea clinics at a lot of institutions. I don't know if you have one, but as you shift over to NT Pro BNP, this is the threshold value to use uh, for your dyspnea clinic if you have one. Now, a lot has been made about the role of natriuretic peptides for prognosis. And I'm going to split this into um, acute heart failure and then again to chronic heart failure. In, in acute heart failure, we've shifted over, and I, you know, I'd be interested in the question and answer session to see if you're doing this yet. We've started looking at the pre-discharge value in people with acute heart failure, because it's been shown again and again that while the, the presenting value is helpful for prognosis, to the extent that, again, I, I'll say it one last time, that large number that you see in acute heart failure is driven substantially by the volume overload in these people. And as you rectify volume overload, you get a reduction in NT pro BNP. The pre-discharge value, whether you use the absolute value or a relative percent, both are important for prognosticating. And in fact, in the guidelines, it's now recommended to, to get a pre-discharge value because those individuals with a significant drop those folks typically have a more favorable, um, a more favorable uh, prognosis. Um, for those in particular, again, you're looking for those who have a that just aren't their wall stress hasn't been substantially improved yet, non-falling or rising values. Those are individuals that you know are at higher risk. And while we're very intensely aware of hospital length of stay, 
We are also obviously in intensely aware of the downsides to rehospitalization. So um, our typical recommendation is for those individuals with a low or 30% reduction NT pro BNP, those folks can be discharged to the routine follow-up. We typically do a, a follow-up at two to four weeks for these individuals. Um, those individuals with a modest reduction or you know a, a modest elevation at discharge, these are people we'll see within a week or two after discharge um, in our in our uh, transitions clinic. And those individuals that have a, a high value or non-falling value, we will either delay their discharge or um, hook them up with home monitoring um, together with a consideration for uh, for aftercare um, rather than sending them directly home. Uh, and, and, you know, and so it gives us an opportunity to individualize the approach we take for folks because, you know, the people who have a, an NT pro BMP that behaves, you know, they're unlikely to run into trouble. Whereas those folks with the moderate or high concentrations, they're obviously higher risk. And, and that's how we bridge from hospital to home. And, and, and the, outpatient application now revolves again on uh, about the signals that you're measuring in a in a relatively decongested population and much like with bnp um, concentrations of nt pro bnp in ambulatory heart failure patients are remarkably prognostic lower is always better in ambulatory folks whether you're talking about mortality or hospitalization and mortality events What's important to recognize is that, um, uh, and these results are post-treatment, is that you can always do better in, well, I shouldn't say always, you can often do better um, in terms of uh, optimizing heart failure care. I run our guideline-directed medical therapy clinic, and one of the metrics that we use to, to as we're maximizing medical care, regardless of the natriuretic peptide, but one of the metrics that we use to judge um, treatment responsiveness and subsequent prognosis is the post-treatment natriuretic peptide value. We aim for a value under 1,000. That in am ambulatory heart failure parlance is, um, uh, you know, the threshold value below which risk be, uh, is really quite low, but there's other factors to think about there as I'm about to show you. The other thing is we measure it every three months or so in our stable patients. Why would we do that? Well, it's been shown by others, but we have data we're about to publish showing that if you start at, say, two years before a hospital event, people in red are people without a hospitalization, people in blue are those who did have a hospitalization, and look at the arc of trajectory of NT pro BNP. Um, when measured serially, there's actually an upward bias in those who have an event versus a downward bias versus in those who do not weeks to months before the event happens. And so it provides useful opportunity to identify individuals who might need to be considered for advanced heart failure evaluation, right heart cath, another echo, cardiopulmonary exercise testing, reassessment of medical therapy to make sure that they are being adherent to their medical care, adjustment in medical therapy, all aspects. In addition, when you think about, and I'm going to say this in a couple of slides, when you think about what the high and non-suppressible NT pro BMP might be telling you, there are a couple of important factors to remember. The first is in an ambulatory patient, I've said this a dozen times already, but in a relatively non-congested ambulatory patient, it's about cardiac structure and function. Right. So in somebody who's got a high or rising natriuretic peptide value, it is likely they are remodeling their left ventricle, whether from progressive cardiovascular dysfunction, progressive ischemia, periods of AFib, worsening pulmonary hypertension. On the other hand, people with a suppressed or lowered change in their natriuretic peptide, um, we see improvements in ejection fraction and reductions in volume. So it's, it's necessary to shift your paradigm, right? So acute heart failure, volume overload, chronic heart failure, cardiac structure and function. But it's not just that. And that's an important key to remember. So um, again, in recently decompensated patients, we see them quickly if we think that they're at high risk and we often will remeasure within a week or two after discharge. Stable outpatients, we typically measure every three months. Those individuals that are at or below 1,000, 
um, yeah, you know, we we reasonably defer their sort of you know routine testing, echo, etc. Um, if they're feeling well and there's no clear evidence for decompensation uh, or progression, um, uh, th the other thing is that serial measurements facilitate GDMT decision making. We often will use our NT ProBNP in the GDMT clinic not only to monitor risk, but also as we're adding. Neprolysin inhibition, SGLT2 inhibition, uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonism. Um, you know, the need for loop diuretics begins to become less and less uh, a pressing issue. And we use the NT Pro BNP to help us to remove the loop diuretic. And that may seem like kind of a, like, I don't know if I need that, right? You can have your patient weigh them, themselves at home. But it's remarkably comforting when you have someone that has been on, you know, whopping doses of a loop diuretic. And now you've got them on, you know, four drug GDMT maximized, and you're able to make that last step of stopping the last 20 milligrams of furosemide. Measuring NT pro BMP after taking the loop diuretic off is one of the ways that we know that the person isn't going to come back in in pulmonary edema in the emergency department. As well, um, as I said, we monitor for these people, those with elevated or rising concentrations. In ambulatory heart failure, again, under 1,000 is your goal. Of course, everyone's got their set point that sometimes you can't get them below. That is prognostic, as I said, all the way back when I was talking about the PRIDE study. The lowest achievable natriuretic peptide in chronic heart failure tells you where your patient is heading. Serial measurements tell you what, how soon the event may occur. So if you've got someone that's got um, you know, an, a non-suppressed or rising value, I go through the steps that I mentioned earlier. These are the people that are going to run into issues, and these are the people who require the real focus. Now, for those that have markedly elevated concentrations, besides the fact that they may just have a progressively remodeling ventricle, it's important to remember again that there is a differential diagnosis for everything in medicine. And markedly elevated natriuretic peptides should set off alarm bells that there may be something being missed. The, the diagnosis that I, you know, I tend to be finding all the time now that I'm looking under rocks for it is the presence of cardiac amyloid. Infiltrative cardiomyopathies may elevate natriuretic peptide values independently of filling pressures. So although I said earlier, if there's market elevation, 10,000 or higher for NT pro BNP, that would be like a BNP of 1,000. You know, that, although that is typically associated with, you know, congestion, there are diagnoses that can cause values that high where you put a, a right heart catheter in and you find a wedge pressure of eight, right? And, and you, you know, if you've got somebody who's got an NT pro BMP of five or 6,000, and no matter how much you're adjusting the loop diuretic, all that's happening is their creatinine is rising inexorably. Think about amyloid. The amyloid protein um, injures the cardiomyocyte. Troponin is often for elevated in these people as well. Um, and uh, causes release of natriuretic peptides completely independent of filling pressures to a great degree, right? So just a, a little uh, thing to remember. So what about the future? I'm going to wrap up by telling you where we are really now and where we're going. The ACCHA, HFSA heart failure guidelines actually talk about the use of natriuretic peptides to prevent heart failure onset. What a concept. Can you identify the signal before the clinical diagnosis occurs? And this speaks to the universal definition of heart failure stages, where stage A are people at risk, diabetes being the paradigm, but hypertension, prior coronary disease, et cetera. Stage B are people that have structural heart disease, but no symptoms, right? And so it begs the question, you know, where are we going to focus if we're going to try to prevent? And of course, it's in those stages where clinical heart failure has not been made, the diagnosis has not been made. And that idea of using biomarkers is to identify um, the presence of wall stress before even structural changes may be evident. And this is important because the previous paradigm for stage B heart failure or pre-heart failure was asymptomatic left ventricular dysfunction, i.e. they've already got structural changes. But it's been recognized 
that you can actually detect signals before cardiac abnormalities are present. So this, this is, these are seminal data from Steve Seliger and uh, Christy Filippi from the Cardiovascular Health Study, looking at elderly patients without structural heart disease as a function of prognosis and NT pro BNP. So back in the dark ages, 13 years ago. Um, stage A was not, it was, so the presence of an abnormal natriuretic peptide was not um, associated with stage B as it is now. So previously, we'd look at these people who are at risk, but without structural heart disease and say, well, what the heck is this you know, all about? Elevated natriuretic peptides. Now notice the hazard ratio begins to rise at or above that 125 threshold that we talked about, right? And what's interesting is when measured serially, those individuals that had a, a rise over time had a higher value, a higher risk for incident heart failure. And we've seen this again and again now. Take another stage A diagnosis like diabetes and measure serially over time. Those individuals that have a rising um, NT pro BNP, regardless of whether they did or did not have past heart failure, a rising NT pro BNP was associated with a higher risk for incident heart failure. So for all these reasons, stage B is now redefined, sort of like rebranding, the stage formerly known as B, um, as presence of structural heart disease, um, as evidenced by uh, abnormalities on imaging, elevated filling pressures, or an abnormal biomarker, either high sensitivity troponin or natriuretic peptide. So there's a paper in Jack Heart Failure this week from the ARIC investigators. We have one coming out in Jack momentarily. Um, and we asked the same question, which is, is that logical? What, what is the impact of adding elevated biomarkers to shift people out of previous stage A to stage B? Does it work? Does it matter? So what we found was that by doing that in this pooled analysis of Framingham, um, Framingham, uh, uh, Prevend and uh, CHS um, and MESA, what we found was that by adding biomarkers, it particularly shifted women to stage B as well as more Hispanic individuals and black individuals. So that's important because it helps to uh, you know, rebalance our ability to recognize risk in populations that often heart failure risk is underappreciated, number one. Number two, although the denominator got much bigger, substantial, 20% redistribution, the ability to stratify risk in the left panel was preserved, which means many more individuals could be identified as being at high risk for transition to symptomatic heart failure or cardiovascular death. So for all of these reasons, the role of natriuretic peptides, not just for diagnosis of acute heart failure, diagnosis of chronic heart failure, heart failure monitoring either in the hospital or in the office has now been endorsed by the ACCAHA guidelines as well as the American Diabetes Association for identifying risk in ambulatory individuals who may be posse symptomatic. So for in the case of individuals with diabetes, people may not do much. They may just sit on the couch all day it's hard to elicit symptoms in these individuals. So the ADA put their foot down hard recently and said, measurement of a natriuretic peptide or high sensitivity uh, troponin at least yearly is now recommended. Um, and the threshold values are just the same as what we use uh, for outpatient, uh, outpatient diagnosis. So an NT pro BMP of 125, uh, which is how the universal definition of heart failure rolls as well. So. Um, definitely an emerging potential application that uh, I think we're going to see more and more of as we move forwards. So to wrap things up, we talked about biology. I find that uh, complex biology of natriuretic peptides so interesting. We talked about the established clinical applications. As you shift to NT pro BNP across your health system, 300 to rule it out, 450, 900, and 1800 for those age categories to rule it in. Remember, between those those values, there's you know a higher and higher likelihood for acute heart failure. Think of it as a continuous variable. So even if you're below the cutoff for abnormal, if it fits the picture, it's more likely heart failure than not. And then remember that you know there's no such thing as a normal elevated natriuretic peptide, and that that emerging role 
for stratifying risk in ambulatory individuals is really going to be a, a really important um, application. So in the past 20 to 22 years now, NT ProBMP has gone from a curiosity to an essential tool. Every hospital in the in the United States measures a natriuretic peptide at this point, and globally, NT ProBMP is by far the largest measured peptide uh, for individuals with suspected heart failure, and it 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 supplements clinical judgment. It doesn't replace it, but it's an aid in diagnosis and prognosis as well as potentially for prevention. So I'm going to stop there. I look forward to questions and answers. Thanks very much to you all for the invitation. Hey, Jim, this is Jali. That was just a wonderful, masterful lecture. Thank you so much. So many lessons and points of discussion there. Uh, just to get uh, the discussion going, uh, uh, something that I was wondering about is, uh, I, I think you're, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you're the only one that is part of both the universal definition of MI and universal definition of heart failure and coming up with criteria to guide how to diagnose this very two common clinical syndromes. Uh, and for uh, myocardial infarction, cardiac pointing is central to the diagnosis diagnosis. I'm just curious in your take on, on the role of necroactive peptides for the contemporary diagnosis of acute heart failure in relationship to that analogy. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and yes, I, I am on both uh, task forces. Um, you know, heart failure is a clinical diagnosis. Uh, it has always been a clinical diagnosis, but, you know, I'm on a task force with the Europeans now as well, working on this. And there is absolutely no question that we are essentially shifting to put natriuretic peptides centrally into the, the, the discussion around heart failure because heart failure as a clinical diagnosis begins to fall apart when a person has no symptoms, right? And yet, um, if we're really going to be serious about prevention of progressive cardiovascular dysfunction culminating in symptomatic heart failure, we have to accept that the diagnosis can be made um, even in the absence of the clinical variables that we think of uh, when we're when we're making the diagnosis of heart failure, and so the Europeans are making the potentially bold move of uh, you know getting rid of the the term pre heart failure for stage B and just calling it heart failure you know without symptoms, right? Um, so you know it, it continues to evolve. I, I don't know where we're going to come down on that, but um, just like with acute myocardial infarction. Uh, you know, the role of biomarkers is really becoming central. Thanks. And then I'll pass the microphone here to others. But before that, one, one other question is, I don't know, and you probably know this, I don't know who coined the term dry uh, BNP. Uh, I think I first heard it from Alan myself, but but what, what is a good clinical, uh, how, how do you determine this, this is the dry BNP? Yeah, I don't like the term, Yadder, because people with heart failure, maybe optivolemic with, you know, wedge pressures that are not dry. Um, and furthermore, um, using a term like the dry BNP renders the belief that a person can't be any better than they are. Um, and it, it, it is reflective of the older generation focusing in the biomarker world, focusing on congestion as the driver of BNP, when there's so much more that can, can drive values of natriuretic peptides above and beyond fluid, right? And so, you, you know, people coming into the GDMT clinic at MGH are dry, and yet we can reduce their NT pro BMPs by 50% by putting them on Secubitril Valsartan, an SGLT2 inhibitor. So, so uh, you know, I don't use that term. I do look at the medical management, and if a person is on optimal GDMT, um, and their NT pro BNP is, you know, whatever, uh, you know, 2000, that tells me that, you know, they're not, uh, you know, and, and their physical exam doesn't suggest congestion. It, it tells me that they're, that's where their heart muscle is set at. And so I don't, I don't use the term dry BNP, but conceptually the idea is it's as low as you're going to get it. And that tells you where their risk is. And, uh, you know, um, I, 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 you, you saw it during the lecture. I try to try to disabuse people of thinking as, as of this as a congestion marker because it drives us away from all of the good tools that we have that that can lower natriuretic peptides besides diuretics. Well, thank you for uh, making Monday morning worthwhile. It was a great talk.
Uh, what do we know about the mechanism for the release of this uh, into the circulation from the myocyte? And does it also apply to troponin? Yeah, oh, great, great question. And um, thank you for that. So I, I, like I really held back on the biology just because, you know, it's like a, it is Monday morning, right? And we've all only just had one cup of coffee. But um, there's some really, really interesting um, biology behind the release. And I'll, I'll simplify it, but it's, it's really cool. Um, so the first thing is A and P is stored. Right, I showed you the electron dense granules uh, for A and P. It turns out the Bs are not stored. They are um, constitutively, continuously um, synthesized at low level. So all of us have a little bit of BNP synthesis and secretion, even in health. Um, and the body revs it up when there's a signal for why it's needed. Now, when the when there's wall stress and the, the synthesis goes up, the intracellular precursor, ProBMP108, is produced rapidly and then cleaved by corin or furin, um, typically in the Golgi apparatus or the reticular, uh, the, the um, endo, endoplasmic reticulum. Um, and then it's released out of the cardiomyocyte. What is really interesting is that N-terminal glycosylation that I mentioned earlier briefly, but um, when there's a lot of wall stress, the N-terminal glycosylation goes down and allows furin to get in there and cleave ProBMP108 into active BNP. So there's a almost like a, a spigot that gets turned where the, the sugar residues in the N-terminus um, go away to allow furin to cleave, right? And in addition, and this is really cool, when you treat people with Entresto, with Secubitril Valsartan, the glycosylation goes back up and you can't cleave it anymore. And so it's, it's sort of a way that the body regulates how much bioactive BNP is available, which I think is really interesting because ProBNP108, that uncleaved precursor, doesn't stimulate cyclic GMP much at all. Um, now, troponin is completely different, and Dr. Sandoval can teach you about it, but um, troponin is found, 96% of it is found in the sarcomere. There is some in transition or in transport in the cytosol, probably going through similar you know, places to be degraded. Why this is, nobody knows. Fred Apple doesn't believe there's a cytosolic pool. I do. And the reason why I do is because I've, I've detected it. So we have isolated troponin in people with myocardial infarction and people without. And what we found is that in those without MI, a small but significant percentage is found in exosomes, which are these little blebs that cardiomyocytes put off of their cytosol. So if there's no cytosolic troponin, why is it in exosomes? Um, you know, and so um, troponin is a little different, actually, uh, from, from natriuretic peptides. You know, one of the questions that's coming up here in the chat is from our, one of our colleagues, Dr. Rito Saxena, who's asking, and I think you alluded to this, is the relationship between BNP and anti-proBNP. So she's asking uh, this proportionality of six to eight times the BNP, uh, how, how does that work or does it fall apart in any application? Yeah, that's a, a, a great question from Dr. Saxena. Thank you. Um, so, so. There's, there's no easy answer, unfortunately. Um, I, I, you know, I get asked this all the time in clinical trials, you know, um, for inclusion criteria, what cutoffs to use, et cetera. And there's no easy um, correction factor uh, from one to the other. What I can tell you is in health, they are much similar to each other than in disease. In other words, um, a normal BNP is like, what, five to 10? And a normal NT pro BMP may be 10 to 20. So it's only a factor of like one to two. Whereas when you get into acute heart failure, it, it gets up to that sort of six to eight fold difference, right? So the differences widen as the numbers go up. Um, so in acute heart failure, which is still in the United States of America, about 60 to 70% of our natriuretic peptides are measured in the ER or in the hospital soon after, 70 ish. Um, you know, contextually in the acute setting, it's around six to eight fold different, you know, um, in the office, they're much similar to much more similar. So the optimal cutoff 
<clears throat> for example, in the office for BNP to exclude. So for NT Pro, it's 125. For BNP, it's 35, right? So it's only about a fourfold difference. And, and I, I know we're past time, but, but you know, I've used one of the questions that's coming up, and, and I have an interest in this too. Is uh, uh, as you know, uh, PJ Devereaux and others have done a lot of group, uh, work in uh, preoperative risk yeah. education and use of network peptides. Is that something that uh, you do in your practice indoors, or, or what's the best way to use this in the preoperative setting? Yeah, what a great question. We haven't gotten our heads around this yet, Yadder. You know, um, so what 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 Dr. Sandoval is talking about is. Um, and in fact, the ESC guidelines now have incorporated this. Um, it's been shown that if you think about all of the work we do for preoperative risk stratification, you know, all of the pre-op clearance in quotes, I put it in quotes because I, I, you know, if there are very few things that make me tweet up in a negative way on in Twitter, but pre-op clearance consults just drive me up the wall. Um, you know, all the clearance we do is is meaningless in most cases, but really what you're looking for is the risk for heart failure. I mean, let's be honest, right? You know, yes, post-op MIs happen, um, but, you know, uh, post-op heart failure is a real high-risk situation, you know, aortic stenosis, et cetera. So um, the, the data that the otter's talking about is the fact that an elevated natriuretic peptide pre-op very strongly predicts post-op complications. And so the ESC has actually incorporated that as, as a recommendation as incorporating natriuretic peptides for pre-op clearance. Um, we don't do it yet, um, but I, I, to be honest with you, I, I think it's a, a really interesting and compelling potential application. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. This was just wonderful. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Thank you. Really, really grateful. Great to see you all.